Next, uh, approval of the minutes uh, from our special called, uh, let's see, special for our regular board uh, meeting July 6th, and also the minutes for the special called meeting of July 22nd, and the minutes from the special called meeting of July 29th. I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler. I have a second by Mr. Carroll. Discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. Uh, next important dates. Uh, August 5th, Davie County Early College High School's first day of schools for students. Summer is over. Uh, August 20th, uh, Friday at 8.30 a.m., uh, Davie County Schools Convocation. Um, August 24th, Tuesday, is the first day of school for Davie County Schools. Board of Education meeting back here on September the 7th, and that is at 6 p.m. with our uh, closed session starting at 5.15? Yes, starting at 5.15. Uh, and then uh, also that same night as the Davie County Board of Commissioners meeting as well. Next time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Wallace for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us, board and staff members, um, <clears throat> and uh, still those that are viewing online. Um, I want to take a moment. We, uh, Davie County Schools, in particular Davie County High Schools, had uh, two gentlemen that retired both last week that have played an integral part in Davie County Schools for years, and that is both Mike Absher and Doyle Nicholson. I don't, t you know, all of our retirees are important to us, but I want to mention that those two gentlemen uh, were instrumental in what they have done regarding the high school and the transition. Uh, that we made a few years ago uh, from the old campus, the previous campus, to this one. Both of them, again, are retiring and going to teach. One's, uh, Mike, will be teaching some biology and Bible class and in a private school, and um, Mr. Doyle Nicholson's going to a private school and teaching sixth grade math. So from a high school principal of 1,750 kids and a faculty of 150 to teaching sixth grade math. So... Uh, congratulate both of them. And one side note, um, in Doyle's office, he had this on, we had this ongoing battle. He had a Carolina banner, and I always talked about writing him up. He didn't remove it. So in my box today was an envelope with that. He said, you always wanted me to take this down. So here it is. <laughs> so <laughs> I sent it to him. Uh, I sent him a picture of it to him. I didn't quite know it would be there. So either way, congrats. Thank you again for all of our retirees, but in particular tonight, those two. Uh, you, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the early college um, high school tonight is their open house. Spoke to Ms. Lynch a little bit ago. They're rolling. They're excited. And um, things are, she said, things are, you know, always the typical excitement around the beginning of school. It's not quite the same, but she said the staff is good and solid and kids are ready to go. So we're, we appreciate you mentioning that uh, tonight as well. July 20th and 21st was our admin retreat. I want to commend Ms. Lyon and her staff. We had a, an outstanding two days. Um, many times, administrators and principals in particular, they don't get time to just stop and think and spend time thinking out loud or thinking together. But we had some good time uh, those two days. Uh, Dr. Larry Coble walked us through a, a, a day, the, July 20th. We focused primarily on culture, and then we spent the afternoon in, in, in group alike uh, configurations and really got a lot accomplished. The next day we had uh, Dr. Phil Warwick was with us from Solution Tree and uh, author of a book that I'd shared with some of you and, and I know some of you board members were able to come by and spend some time and I want to commend you and thank you for that uh, for being there but it was two really good days and um, I will say that our staff, our principals primarily, we had a coaching staff, coaches, our social coaches, uh, uh, literacy coaches and folks there and they were able to walk away with some things in hand about what we're, we're going to do differently. And uh, Ms. Lund is working with um, Mr. Dr. Warwick and, and hopefully to do some future, future work as well. It's, it's, it's good stuff. And primarily the topic was high reliability schools. And, and it's the practices that you put in place. And it's not a program. It's just common sense, basic practices that are, that are to be sustained to, to, to have ongoing academic growth. Um, convocation 
as you well know, is scheduled for August the 20th, that Friday morning, August 20th at 8.30. We did make a decision this week uh, to make that virtual. So we principals are aware of that. So the, the convocation, um, with that, if not, if not, we would have been we would have brought been bringing, you know, 800 or more people into the gym. But that, that convocation, and many of you have some roles in that. If you don't know that, you'll be told tonight. If you haven't been told already, right, Miss Deanna? And uh, but that again, that's 8:30 Friday morning, August the 20th, and that will be virtual. And those those speaking as a part will be right here as you did as we did last year so all right um and as you know we have made a range with as you as you all will recall the teacher of the year will receive a car a new car to drive thanks to flo honda and brian nicolay one of our david county citizens but he will be on site where the teacher of the year works and i can't tell you that because i'd give it away um, just got to be careful here, but either way, we've communicated with Brian, and we have another local realtor that we were that's going to recognize all of our teachers of the year, and we're still working out arrangements with him, whether he'll be here the day of the convocation, but we will commend him, but is reaching out to share a gift. Um, so either way, we that's good stuff coming. I want to make sure that you all are aware, and audience, and, and everyone of House Bill 91. House Bill 91. Um, would basically dissolve the North Carolina High School Athletic Association and appoint a legislative group, a group of legislators would appoint a body to run the High School Athletic Association or High School Athletics. Now, I'm, I'm giving you the real broad perspective here, but I can't, I can't I, obviously I'm interested as a superintendent and the, our question is to Alan Duncan, the vice chair, so if you dissolve the High School Ethical Association, who's going to pick it up? And they're admittedly not ready to do that. So this has been going on back and forth for quite a while, but last week the, the, the High School Ethical Association board and their staff met with some lawmakers. And understanding the, the meeting went very well. Uh, so we're not sure what's going to happen. I'm glad to hear it went well. I will tell you that one of Mike Absher's departing gifts to me was to appoint me or recommend me to be on a be on a committee with the associate with the High School Ethics Association. It's called an Endowment Advisory Committee. So one of the reasons that the High School Athletic Association has been criticized recently is because of their endowment, the $40 million. Now, endowments have restrictions, and you all know that. But either way, I was in a two to two and a half hour meeting last week or week before regarding how to spend that money. And that consists of superintendent, myself and one other superintendent, coaches, ADs, principals, and those folks. So it was a really good meeting. So I want you to be aware of it. Um, but I feel like when some progress was made that it won't be dissolved, which is not what we want to happen, I will tell you. As a former coach, former member, and as a superintendent, there are things we work through, but we're staying actively involved with that just to make sure that um, we voice our opinion and we do. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Everyone is well aware in this audience and in, in our community that we're still in the battle against COVID-19. There are tough decisions being made by this board, by staff, by parents in our community. And it's hard and I understand that. And we don't have all the answers, I promise you that. But we must remain united in this effort to keep our staff, students and others safe. We have differences, but we will continue to monitor the situation and work together. We will continue to work with local health officials, DHHS, both state and local, ABC Collaborative, and groups that we continue to receive information from. Participated in a, in a, a session earlier today with the North Carolina DPI and, and DHHS. Uh, many staff and parents and community, community members have shared their thoughts about the current plans for reopening school. Whether we agree or disagree, I want to say thank you. It's important that we hear from you. It's important that we continue to communicate, and we will continue to do that together. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Uh, next, uh, recognitions, and I will call on Mr. Rob Raisbeck. 
uh, for recognition of Spencer Williams. Good afternoon. Appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you, uh, board members, Mr. Wallace. Uh, Mr. Pruitt, our new principal from Davie High School is here, so thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you just briefly. My name is Rob Raisbeck. I'm the track and cross country coach at Davie High School. And this young man is Spencer Williams. Uh, Spencer, you've probably read about him in the Enterprise the last few months, actually going back several years. And um, we're going to highlight some of his accomplishments. Uh, also with him here uh, this evening, this afternoon, his mother, Diane Williams, who is on staff at Davie High. Um, she is also on staff with our track team, uh, coaching our throwers. Spencer's grandmother, uh, Miss Carol Dressler, is also here. And the man with the gun, uh, Sergeant Jones, is our SRO at the high school, as you know, and he is on staff uh, as our assistant cross-country coach. Um, Spencer's had a tremendous year, and I could speak for an hour, but I promise I won't. Give me about 60 seconds, and we'll be done. But some of the things that Spencer has accomplished uh, during the last year. Uh, he is the CPC champion in both the discus and the shot put. Uh, led our team to a uh, second place finish at conference, our highest finish I'm told since 1997, and probably the first time we've beaten West Forsyth in several decades, so that was fun. Uh, he was named the CPC athlete, uh, or field athlete of the year for that performance. Um, a couple weeks later, we went to the uh, 4A Midwest Regional, which Davie High School um, hosted. 19 4A schools were present. Um, Spencer placed uh, first again in the discus and the shot and set the regional meet record in the discus, I believe, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, led our team to, was it the discus or the shot, was the regional I'm record? Both. Okay, all right. <laughs> go big or go home, right? Uh, led our team to a uh, third place finish at the region, uh, again, probably our highest in many, many years. Went on to the state championship meet. Uh, in the latter part of June, uh, Spencer uh, was the state champion in the shot put uh, and then placed second in the discus in the state. During the course of the year, uh, amongst all athletes and all classifications in the state of North Carolina, Spencer was ranked number one in both the discus and the shot. The great thing is he's only a junior. We get him back next year. Um, so uh, in addition, uh, Spencer broke the North Carolina State High School record for the junior class in both throws events, the discus and the shot put. Uh, he was ranked in the top 10 in the United States in the junior class in both events. Um, he led our team to an eighth place finish at the state championships for 4A, which again is probably the highest we finished in many years. Uh, following the state championship meet, Spencer uh, went out with his family to Eugene, Oregon, uh, participate in the Nike uh, U.S. High School uh, Championships, placed in the top ten in the discus and the shot put as a junior. That's competing against seniors as well. Um, we're almost done, but we're still going. Uh, for his exploits, uh, Spencer was named the North Carolina State Gatorade Track and Field Athlete of the Year. For all athletes, all classes in the state of North Carolina, Gatorade Player of the Year, Spencer Williams. Uh, they will be provided, uh, the Gatorade organization will be sending a banner to the high school, um, which hopefully will get hung in the gym. Um, as of Sunday when I was up there, it hadn't come in, but hopefully it'll come in shortly. Uh, they also authorized uh, Spencer to be permitted to designate uh, a $1,000 award to any nonprofit organization of his choosing and he has designated, he and his family, um, the Victory Junction Camp, uh, which is the petty organization for, um, for children. And uh, again, I could go on forever, but you have other business. So, Spencer, great job. Thank you.
I knew I knew Rob would miss something. <laughs> Congratulations. Absolutely incredible. <clears throat> uh, next on our agenda is a consent agenda, and I will uh, entertain a motion. Chairman Junker, if I may interrupt, please. Um, each board member should have an addendum to the personnel report that's hot off the press this afternoon with some additions. Tis the season, and we are trying to staff quickly before school starts. So please be sure that you look over that addendum as it will be part of the consent agenda. Thank you for all your work. It's not getting any easier. Now I'll entertain a motion including the addendum. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler. I have a second by Ms. Webb. Any questions? All those in favor? Motion carries 6-0. Again, thank you. Uh, next, uh, committee and staff reports. I'll call on Mr. Harris for revenue and expense. Good afternoon. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the preliminary year-end uh, revenue and expenses. Please understand I said preliminary. We haven't been through our audits yet. So um, there may be, still be some modifications or whatever that, that comes about from that. But so preliminary just so you can kind of know where we ended the year. The notes aren't up here. Um, when you take a look at where we are, as you'll see, um, our spending was below our revenue. Uh, in all categories. Um, if you take a look at the state um, category, there's about $6,200 difference in the expense and the revenue. Um, when I went back and did the um, check and balance with the year in zero out, the DPI issues, I believe they made a mistake. And so um, I have called them to get clarification on their zero out as well as contacted our external auditors just to validate the information that I have is correct. It appears that they, uh, they took $6,200 more than they should have. So um, uh, we're, we're working through that. It's been probably two and a half weeks that we've been working through that. So, um, But as you'll see, we, we finished the year um, very positive uh, from a revenue and expense perspective overall across all categories. So when you take a look at um, categories, let's see if I can get, we got notes. I, I'm going to try and do it off memory. My notes aren't on here. I apologize. Um, when you take a look at the, uh, the categories and everything else, um, we, we remained constant at about 84% for our personnel uh, salary and benefits, which is typically where, where we are every, every month or every quarter, as well as most LEAs. Um, and then you'll see, you'll see across the other categories where we are um, yeah, from, from that perspective. Of the food category, please remember that that includes our child nutrition. So that's food that we purchased for our meals as well. So that's the reason it's one, almost $1.2 million. When we take a look at it from a state perspective, um, state directs us to um, compensate, use that money for salaries and benefits by and large. Um, so 94% of our spending in that category was directly related to salary and benefits. From a local perspective, um, this, this is the salaries for the individuals that we can't pay out of federal and state. Um, we pick those up in local, including maintenance, because that has to be paid out of uh, local category. And so the vast majority of this is um, directed at school operations, um, so we keep the buildings up and, and work through um, issues that arise in our utilities, that type of thing. So really around school operations. You take a look at our federal program. Federal is going to be used for um, grant funding. So that there'll be uh, things that we get grants, such as Title I, EC, um, those type of grants. And, and there'll be a, a wide variety inside of that. But the vast majority, again, is in personnel, salary, and benefits. Um, and then there'll be staff development inside of this as well, and student development as we work through PD from that perspective. Um,
capital outlay. Our capital outlay budget um, is used for really school operations and those projects that, uh, for lack of a better word, are capital. Things that where we're improving facilities or building new facilities, um, kind of maintaining what we have in the high volume or high uh, expense category. So you, you'll see facility repairs at a million dollars is really where we are. And these are our projects that typically are contracted out as we take a look at that. School nutrition, again, school nutrition is is an enterprise fund, and so uh, we like to see them to be self-sufficient. Our school uh, nutrition program does a great job managing their budget. Um, we're in the minority when it comes to a district that doesn't have to um, sustain our school nutrition. They sustain themselves. And so that, that is a great opportunity for us. And, and I think George, I think he's in the audience for that. Um, when we take a look at it, as we work through that, they are completely self-sufficient. We, do, we don't have to pump any money into their program. So. And then the, the last category is uh, special revenue. So this is our fund date. So the, this is grants or funding that we get for specific reasons. Um, Mebbin Foundation, when they donate money to us um, for our programs and everything else. So this becomes very specific in where we, where we use this money. And so, uh, again, personnel is inside of that. Staff development is inside of that. Um, and then student-based opportunities that we have that we try and offer for our students. So I'll, I'll end by saying we ended the year in a very good spot. Tough year and where, where we are and what we've done and what, what we've had to accomplish. Um, I feel very good about where we are, how we've operated. I think our uh, actual audit is at the end of this month, and so we'll know, um, have a better feel for where we are after everything finishes up with the audit. But like I said, I talked to external auditors. Um, matter of fact, I hung up the phone with them this afternoon about this situation and, and where we are. So we've already started giving them all that, all the information so they can go ahead and get started now. Um, and uh, very, very positive. So uh, I commend uh, every bit of our teams and departments and our schools for what they do, managing through what they, their budgets and everything else. So any questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Where, where does the activity buses, was it on that report there for capital outlay? Did, did we not purchase a at least one bus we didn't purchase we we're at, we have a lease option okay. on one bus and we we make that payment along with synovia that's part of that school operations um so that's inside of that so it's a, a four-year lease um i think we're in our uh, this will be our third year in the four-year lease if i remember correctly okay questions any other questions Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, I'll call on Ms. Foyle for accountability update. Good evening, Chairman Junker, board members, Mr. Wallace, um, staff and guests. I'm here tonight to give you a quick accountability update. Uh, my much longer presentation will be next week, next next month, not next year, next month, because Mr. Harris and I should never do numbers back to back. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an update tonight about what the accountability reporting will look like for this past year. It's going to be a little different, and so I wanted to give you kind of a heads up and hey, this is what we're going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about. So first of all. Um, there's a difference, not because of COVID, but because in 2021, this past school year, was a standard setting year for our ELA EOGs, so our reading EOGs, and also for um, science and reading NC Extend 1, which are our alternate assessments. So by standard setting, um, every couple of years, we get new content standards that are being taught in the classroom. They then create new tests to go with those new content standards. And then we go through this standard setting process. So they bring in a group of teachers and content experts to look through the test and to look at um, achievement level descriptors. So the State Board of Education has adopted descriptions of achievement levels. 
And so those content experts and teachers go through and they say, this is what a student that's a level five student, which is the top level, that's what they should be able to do. This is what a level four student should be able to do. This is what a level three student should be able to do. And then they take that and they apply those to the new test that we just gave. So once that whole process has gone through, we get to find out what our results are for reading. So I don't even have our results yet for our reading EOGs this past year. Um, in fact, tomorrow the State Board of Education will be approving those, well, if all goes well, they'll be approving those um, specifications tomorrow. And once that happens, probably late this week, early next week, we'll get our reading EOG results. So even internally, we don't have those. Um, as we go through that process, um, all the other results and those results will be presented to the State Board on September 1st. And so they'll become publicly available on that day. I'll do some analysis and then I'll be presenting it again on September 7th what our actual numbers are. So the other differences um, that will be there are about waivers. So of course we had an extraordinary past year and a half and due to um, the situation, North Carolina asked for a waiver from the federal government um, for some of our accountability requirements, not all of them. Um, but the main effect of this waiver was to remove the penalties that we sometimes get when we don't hit our 95% participation rate. And if you've been listening to me for a while, you've heard me talk about 95%. That's the percent of students that we're expected to test. And if you don't test that many students, there are penalties for that. This waiver removed those penalties, so we don't have to worry about those. Um, it also removed the requirement to report our long-term goals. So we have 10-year goals that we have to incrementally get better every year. And so we won't have to report those this coming year or for this past year. And also um, the school performance grades, part of our accountability system, it said you do not have to do those. Now the school performance grades are also included in our state laws. And so you'll see here that uh, there's a bill being discussed currently um, that would remove additional state requirements to report those things. So if that's passed, then we will not um, talk about school performance grades or growth for our schools. The federal waiver did not remove the requirement to test. So of course we did test our students um, and we still have to report our data. So let's talk about what we will report. We will be reporting the performance on all of our end of grade and end of course tests. So that's the percent proficient you've heard me talk about before. We'll also be, and this is new this year and part of that waiver requirement, we'll be reporting on the participation uh, for our end of grade, end of course, uh, work keys and ACT tests. Those are college and workforce ready tests that we do at high school will be reporting on the participation, but not just the percent of participation, but breaking that down into subgroups. Also on the flip side, we'll be reporting on those that didn't participate um, and breaking those down by subgroups. So the state will have to do that, each school and district will have to do that. Now I anticipate not having too much data on the did not participate, we were able to test 95% of our students. And so a lot of that stuff will be suppressed because um, you may be able to identify individual students through those subgroups. Um, so, but a lot of districts that did not get to test a lot of their students may have uh, different participation numbers. Also, we'll be reporting on the percent of our English learner students that will be exiting that status because of their yearly test. And we'll be reporting the cohort graduation rate. So what will we not be reporting out of all that? Um, we are not required to report the ACT or work keys results. Typically we would report this, the percentage of students that hit certain benchmarks um, in those two tests, but the federal waiver says that we don't have to report that, so we won't be reporting that, or math course rigor, which is the percent of graduating high school students that finished math three. Um, so that's what math course rigor is, and the federal waiver relieves us of our requirement to report on that one. So there will be some other things that are different um, besides just what we report. Uh, typically when we go about 
um, talking about how we did, we do some interpretation. And we interpret really in two different ways. One of the ways we interpret is on performance, especially comparing our performance to previous years and that grade level in school. Um, also, maybe performance of cohorts of students moving through school. Um, so we really won't be able to do that this year first because in reading, it's a standard setting year. So standard setting really kind of means you're resetting the bar. Lots of times it's raising the bar, but it's definitely resetting the bar. And that means we won't be able to compare reading to previous years. Um, obviously, um, for other tests, we know that the past year and a half is going to have impact on our scores, and we'll have to take that into consideration when we look at where we are compared to previous years. Of course, we didn't even have any tests in 1920 to compare to, so we're having to go all the way back to 1819 if we're looking at comparing. But obviously, we will take into account that we've had a very difficult past year and a half. The second type of interpretation we usually do is based on comparison, and comparison to other districts, comparison to state averages, this year, it's so complicated uh, because not everybody did things the same way. You're going to have some students who were all virtual for parts of the year or the majority of the year. You're going to have some um, districts that weren't able to test the 95% of their students, so it was much, much lower. So we have to take all that into consideration when we're looking at comparing ourselves. Lots of times we compare ourselves to surrounding districts, or we might compare ourselves to districts in the state that are similar in size, similar in demographic makeup, um, but we'll have to be very careful when we do that this year. So state and other district data um, is released to us at the same time it's released to the public. So we'll get that information on September 1st, and I'll be working with other district leadership between September 1st and the 7th um, on interpreting that data and, and reporting to you out on September 7th um, what we think are valid comparisons and what we don't think are valid comparisons. But I wanted you to kind of have a heads up so I didn't have to say all this next month, um, you know, and what will be different this year as compared to what we've done in the past year. Are there any questions that you have? I don't have any questions. It's okay. just, <laughs> just taken something that's already complicated and made it worse <laughs> for me. Yes. Personally. <laughs> so, but thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Next, I will call on a team uh, to report on the summer camp review. Okay, good afternoon. Um, Chairman Junker, good afternoon. Board members, um, their staff and guests. Um, this definitely takes a team. We uh, got a uh, legislation that was passed back in April, the summer school legislation, and we quickly um, had to work all together to put something in place. And before this team presents, I want to say a thank you to several people. Um, let me start, though, by saying that we normally have one Read to Achieve um, summer camp site, and we normally have a credit recovery camp at the high school. So that went from that um, caliber to having seven sites and inviting all at-risk students um, to come to summer camp. And that also entailed 150 instructional um, hours that were required, not just literacy, but literacy, math, science um, required, as well as PE, as well as enrichment, um, as well as serving lunch and breakfast and transportation as part of that legislation. So this was um, quite a feat. So I want to say thank you um, to a lot of people here in just a second, but I also want to say that before um, before this, this camp started, of course, every district in the state was thinking, how am I going to employ the number of people that we are going to need for this summer camp? First of all, think about the year we just had. 
And then are we actually going to get the number of people that we need to actually staff um, summer camp? And wow, we were extremely fortunate. We did not have one position that was not filled. Um, we had a great number of staff that were interested. Um, Jeremy Miller filled the very last position um, the day before camp. Where is Jeremy? Oh, he's right there. He, um, he had a van monitor that he needed to uh, fill, and so he was on the phone calling and he made it happen. I also want to say that uh, we had visits from the state. Um, NCDPI folks came to visit, and they were just absolutely, um, they, they complimented us. Um, they, one, one person even said, this is where I'd want my child. You know, if I, if I had my child in camp, this is exactly where I would want them. So for someone to say that's where I'd want my personal child, that is, that is quite the compliment. Um, they were very impressed with the in, uh, quality of instruction that was happening, um, just impressed all around. So I want to say a thank you to Transportation Department for rolling everything out with buses and for creating our routes, Child Nutrition Department, for feeding our kids, um, technology team for the tech support, HR and finance um, for contracts, hiring, payroll processes. We, had, we hired a site coordinator at every site. Um, we had curriculum coordinators that were helping to put the curriculum and instruction together, um, teachers, teacher assistants. We had custodians that were hired, bus drivers, office staff. Um, I want to say a thank you again to Ashley Furniture and Cami Webb for helping us put together the cardboard trains and kits and um, it was part of our enrichment activity. Also the pup up courses, um, also to Cognition for helping us. They um, hosted one of our meetings for our site coordinators. So when I say it took a team, <laughs> it took a team and I hope I didn't leave anyone out. Um, so this team, uh, John Marshall is going to tell you some overall data for our district and then um, Emily Moore and Michael Pruitt and Sherry White are going to tell you um, some highlights from our camp. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to go ahead and give you some of the big numbers from the district. So the camp ran June 21st through July 15th. That was 16 days with 150 instructional hours, which was, as you heard uh, Ms. Lyon just say, was um, necessary through the state. Um, teachers did gather for a number of days before camp started to collaborate, set a really good plan to make sure that um, we were meeting the needs of all students and to personalize their learning as best we could to meet those needs. Um, we had seven sites that included five elementary schools, one middle school, and the high school. Uh, the middle school that we used for that is uh, North Davie. We had 129 certified employees and 53 classified employees. That's your uh, teacher assistants, your bus drivers, and custodial staff. Our numbers, um, we have two numbers here, 678 to 712. Uh, we had 712 students accept their position for summer school. Um, as of right now, we're right around 678. We are still trying to get our final numbers as to the actual numbers of students that actually attended. Um, for that number and what we have to report to the state, if they even attended for just one day, they count towards our attendance. So we're still in the process of verifying those numbers and that's why there's a range there. So, I am now going to turn it over to Emily Moore, who is going to talk to you a little bit more about um, what happened in our elementary summer camps. Um, she is the AP at Coolamy and was one of our summer coordinators there at Coolamy. Good afternoon. So, um, <clears throat> like John said, I was the, I shared the site coordinator position at uh, Coolamy. Our instructional coach at Coolamy, Kelly Myers, also helped me. Um, with that. Um, but elementary-wide, uh, we had across the district 600, uh, 469 students that were enrolled in summer camp. Um, based on what we used to show growth ac academically, 208 of those students showed gains in reading based on iReady, and 193 of those students showed gains in math based on iReady. And iReady is what we used statewide last year um, for our reading to show um, to show growth and that is what we used in camp as well uh, just some highlights um, the amazing thing is we had 
four extra weeks with these students um, to bring them back in the building. A lot of virtual students uh, that were virtual last year came to summer camp um, almost to, to bridge them and get them ready to come back to the school year. For those that are not going to remain virtual this year, um, a lot of those came back um, for the four weeks almost to just sort of get their feet wet again and get back in, in school. Um, Research sh shows us that students learn best when they are exposed to grade level material, whole class. So each um, student in elementary school was exposed to their current grade level material. Um, but then we also know that they make the best growth if they're also instructed on their independent level in reading and math. So students were able to, um, to be exposed to grade level material, but you will also see in some of the pictures that they, we had a lot of small group opportunities for students to receive small group instruction in reading and in math. Um, at Coolamy, we had a pirate camp, a pirate theme. You'll notice that um, in other, other schools, uh, there's some beach floats there with students doing their independent work. Um, there were some beach themes. Um, there were themes all the elementary schools each had a different theme that they used and to, to engage and get the students excited about learning. Um, so um, academically, um, like I said, we've made a lot of gains. Um, we also were able to use a lot of research-based interventions. So students that needed the extra support in reading um, were able to use the um, research-based interventions with um, heel wrap and with Hegarty, and we were also um, able to get them um, you know, to make growth um, to get ready for next year. We also had a lot of enrichment opportunities. Uh, we were just able to reach the whole child during camp. They were able to get their academic needs, but we also were able to reach them um, and get them excited. We had art teachers on every campus. We had music teachers. We had guidance counselors. So we were able to do social emotional learning. Um, they loved, loved the putt-putt and train um, STEM activities that we got to, from, from, thank you, Cami Webb, and from Ashley Furniture. Uh, it was just really neat to see the kids hands-on with child-safe tools and nuts and bolts that were made for kids. Um, they, had to, they had to work together. They, you know, it, it took two kids to hold this side of the cardboard and two kids to hold this side of the cardboard, and then someone had to work the tools to get the cardboard to stay together. Uh, so it was just really neat to see the kids um, engrossed in that and, and able to work together and and do something that was not academic based but made them grow as a team a lot of team building activities you'll see in the pictures they were um they were able to play games a lot of kids these days don't they don't get to play games anymore they're too they're doing things online and and playing games is something that a lot of kids don't do anymore so they were playing they were playing board games and they were learning to work together um, we fed them twice a day, thanks to our tribe nutrition department, but we also were able to feed them snacks. Um, so the ones that stayed, kindergarten and first grade students could leave at one o'clock if they wanted to. A lot of them chose not to leave and they wanted to stay all day. And those that stayed the rest of the day were, were able to get an afternoon snack. So there were just a lot of things that we did during camp um, to meet the whole child academically and social and emotionally. Um, and, and we had fourth and fifth graders saying, this is the best camp I've ever been to. Um, so they were excited. And um, it was just really great to see students and teachers working together. Um, the kids would leave music class and they would sing those songs all the way to their next class. Um, they were active, they were, they were engaged, and they were having fun and learning at the same time. So um, we just had a great camp and we're excited about rolling things up in the next couple weeks. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Pruitt for middle school. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the middle school camp, Just a little bit about that. We had uh, 123 students who were enrolled in the camp. Um, 48 of those students ended up showing gains in reading based on the iReady scores. 57 students ended up showing gains in math based on the iReady scores. Um, so similar, similar uh, percentages to those that gained in the elementary schools. Um, 
although I will say that uh, while the gains are important, and that is what we're ultimately here for, uh, there are other uh, motives for our camp at the middle school level as well. And those are probably summarized best by uh, Jeremy Brooks, who was our site coordinator. Um, we had about 20 very dedicated rock star staff um, telling I could take that group of teachers that we had that volunteered for this and build a school and be the, be the best school in the nation probably. They were awesome and every one of them were dedicated um, and we are so proud um, that we were able to work with them and, and get them to work with our students for an additional four weeks this year. Um, but Jeremy Brooks in our opening faculty meeting probably summed it up. You know, we've got four weeks with these kids. You know, COVID has taken basically a year and a half of their education and turn it upside down. We are not going to be able to fix every gap in this time of this four weeks, but what we can do is fix kids. And so our primary motive, yes, we wanted to teach math and social studies and sci or math and reading and science. And we certainly did cover a lot of math and reading and science skills. And we, we tried to highlight some of the most essential skills that would be necessary for the next grade level. But our primary objective was to take kids who had had a really rough year and give them some success in school to make them enjoy school again or to allow them the opportunity to enjoy school again with no grades, no pressure, just the learning, the teachers, the materials, their friends, and, and playing around with the concepts that were, they, that were gonna make them successful um, in the next year. And um, they set out and, and that's what they did. We began every morning with a morning huddle. Jeremy Brooks, everyone was in the gymnasium and he would you know, tell jokes with them, celebrate successes that he had heard of from the next day. And it was, a, it was such a powerful thing to see those kids leaving that gym ready to work every day, um, getting their, their lunch or their breakfast bags on the way out and, um, and, and ready to go. And I think the, uh, the best story that I sort of have from that, I was actually in an IEP meeting, first day of camp, uh, we did camp from 8 to 12, and then the kids ate lunch, and then they could go home, or they could stay after for clubs. Our clubs, we offered, you know, guitar, drum line. We offered cooking clubs. We offered, you know, gaming clubs. We offered um, even some coding. So we did um, a lot of various things there, and we had a lot of kids take us up on that. But um, at about 12, when the kids were getting out on the first day of camp, I happened to be in an IEP meeting. And um, at the beginning of that meeting, it started about 30 minutes prior. And the parent had told me, I don't know what I'm going to do with my kid. He absolutely hates school. He doesn't want to come back, never wants to come back to school again. Um, unscripted, uh, and this is, this is the honest truth, um, right after 12, Parent gets a phone call, says, oh, this is my kid. I have to take it, see what's going on. The kid says, absolutely love today. Can't wait to come back tomorrow. And that was the point of our camp. And I think that's the point of the relationships um, that we are trying to build with students. As you can see, um, we tried to use um, technology um, in the middle school camp was only to be used if it was organic and necessary. We tried to get them away from technology as much as possible, give them a break from that. Um, so we did a lot of hands-on activities. And again, thank you for the materials. Um, our students, um, you can see in the middle picture there, um, some of the putt-putt courses in the top uh, right-hand corner, some of the putt-putt courses that our students designed um, as part of their math and science uh, lessons. Uh, really cool stuff there. Um, you can see some of the other engaging education that's going on, teachers, students interacting. Um, they also um, practice building. You can see our friend, friend Kermit up there. Um, little stools um, as a design challenge to see who could build a stool that would hold up the biggest um, stuffed frog. All kinds of really cool things that were going on um, within this camp. Um, overall, it was a great experience, I think, for the kids. Very worthwhile and um, something that uh, many of them said, hey, if we do this next year, I want to come back for it. So I'm not saying that we have to do that, but um, I'm saying that, um, that there may be more demand for it. But um, do appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak to you about some of the highlights from the um, summer school at the high school. So this is a breakdown of our um, data. We had 126 students who completed all four weeks of summer school. Um, were able to earn 248 credits, and this includes students from Davie High and from the Early College. The majority of those credits were earned face-to-face, -face, and we were very fortunate in that we had teachers sign up that represented um, the content levels that they did. Um, and had taught courses um, at different levels, so we were able to make um, a schedule work, and these are the courses that we were able to teach. Um, physical science, uh, let's see, English three, and then I think we had a health component were the only ones that were offered through GradPoint. 
Um, and so that was our online program. So with this, we had 36 students um, who were able to be promoted to the next grade level. So enrichment courses were legislated, but we also looked at this as an opportunity to expose students to some courses that they may not normally take at high school. Um, students who had failed one or two courses, um, so we're covering rec credit for those courses, but they needed bus transportation to and from school. So they had a hole in their schedule, and so that was their choice period. So they could choose um, career exploration, um, they could choose art exploration, they had opportunities for PE, and they could also choose study hall. So study hall, they had a variety of websites that they could choose from, content-based modules. Um, we used some science modules, some math modules. Um, Major Clarity was an option, ACT Academy. Uh, PE course or activities were offered. For art exploration, we had one of the art teachers at the high school that worked with students to do different activities in um, the art classroom. And so you can see up there on the top picture, they did um, hand cast and they painted them to look like different critters. And so you've got, you know, the peacock up there. I saw dogs and butterflies. Um, they made clay lanterns. We also had four CTE teachers who rotated through and did a class on career exploration. So these were the topics that they did activities within. Um, that's one of the CTE teachers there who's setting up a forensics activity for students. Um, so students got to do activities within all of those areas, so hopefully choosing to, you know, take those courses later on down the line at the high school. So some of the highlights, um, to kind of echo middle school as well, the technology, students were not assigned Chromebooks. They had technology carts that could be checked out, and that was to only enhance what they were doing in the classroom. Um, they were encouraged to do as much hands-on activities, um, and you can see some of them here, um, just to maximize that face-to-face -face instruction and to minimize that, those online options. Um, for the courses, teachers focused on the power standards for the courses that they were instructing, but they also looked at the foundational standards for the course next level up. So, for example, if they were taking English 1, they were getting the power standards from English 1, but then they were also laying the foundation for English 2. So those teachers were able to plan together. Um, I cannot say enough about the teachers, um, the activities and instruction that I saw when I was in the high school, um, the administrators that stepped in when they were needed, and I also cannot say enough about all the hard work and the time that was put in by Cheryl Reeves, who was a site coordinator. Um, and I think that I am last. So I am going to open it up for questions. How did you make the decision about not spending so much time with technology? I'm really pleased to hear that, but that is not what we normally hear in, in education meetings. How was that triggered? So I think for the high school, if you're thinking about technology, these kids you know, were on that hybrid schedule last year and spent a lot of time online. Um, also, thinking about science classes, and you know, science is my background, wanting those kids to have those hand-on opportunities. Um, so being able to work with students, they worked with students in small groups. Um, so having smaller classes, they were able to do that. So they might have some technology as a station that they were using in the classroom. Um, but once again, it was, you know, working with the students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, not just providing instruction, but building those relationships. Any other questions, comments? Absolutely amazing. Uh, just in a, like you talked about in the very beginning as far as the amount of people that were involved in coordinating all this and making it happen we show a few slides but uh, it's absolutely amazing so thank you for all of that thank, thank you. you next I'll call on Michael Spillman for architect update for the virtual school project Good afternoon, Chairman Junker, Board, Superintendent Wallace, staff, guests. I've been asked to come this afternoon to give you an update on where the progress of acquiring an architect for this project down at K Building for the virtual school and the remodel. A um, special called board meeting was held June 7th where you, the Board of Education, voted to move forward with sending out an RFQ for the architectural service for this project. 
After that meeting, RFQ was advertised in the Winston-Salem Journal, Davie County Enterprise, and on our website. Three RF, uh, the RFQ were, was advertised for three weeks, and we received three proposals. Staff reviewed and approved all three of uh, firms within, for an interview process. A committee was established to conduct the interviews. The committee, the committee consists of four staff members and two board members. On August 2nd, the committee interviewed all three firms, and we felt like all the firms gave a good presentation and they were all qualified for the job. And we all got a lot of good ideas from their presentation. But after much discussion after the meeting, we felt that, that one firm's uh, presentation and their experience, we felt that they were best suited for this project for Davie County Schools. Um, staff recommends going into negotiations with this firm for their services. Once this process is complete, staff will bring a contract back to the Board of Education for the approval process. Do you have any questions? You're not going to tell us who that is? We are not. Okay. It's, it's the craziest thing in the world that we have to do this and you can't reveal the firm that we will end up negotiating with, if I understand it correctly, Ms. Wilson is... So you're going to start after uh, you work through REI on this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, you do negotiate with the first choice and attempt to reach um, an acceptable price, and if that's the case, then they will bring that person to you to approve. <laughs> If they Crazy. don't, if they're unable to reach a price that you can accept, then they move to the second choice. So with board, that you said, interpret, I don't have any questions. <laughs> so your interpretation of that is Jill's fault, that we can't tell you who it is. Blame it on the, no, blame it on the attorney. I come is so it can be Jill's fault. Isn't you're, that why I'm, I'm here? here. Yeah. Michael's, Michael's glad you're here. Appreciate Thank it. <laughs> Thank you. Excited to move forward on that. And thank you for the uh, board member's help in that committee as well. Uh, next, I'll uh, public address to the board, and I'll call on Ms. Wilson. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, I believe I can read with uh, some of uh, Mr. Wallace's help the handwriting. If I butcher anyone's name, I'm apologizing in advance. I have illegible handwriting, so I have no excuse. And some of these aren't that bad, but I, I hope I'll do my best. Please remember the rules. Do we have a timer, Clint? Okay, so we're just urging you to keep your own time and to be reasonable about um, the three minutes that we are according you to speak. Our first speaker, I'll call the name of the first speaker and ask you to just say your name and address. And then I'll say the name of the second speaker just so they can be ready to go so we don't have too much lag in time between the two speakers. Our, uh, I'll ask you not to mention personnel by name. I don't think you would anyway, but just to say we have processes to deal with personnel problems and this isn't the proper venue for that. If you have a personnel issue that you need to speak somebody about, uh, Jinda will be happy. I know she's down there somewhere. There she is. Jinda Haynes, our head of personnel, will be happy to talk to you about that, but this is not the appropriate forum for that. So let's start with Ms. Lynn McDaniel. I hope I said that right. And then Jennifer Harada. Hello. Um, I wanted to address pretty much a big elephant in the room and that was the really kind of disappointing decision made on the masking and the fact that the way the meeting, when the meeting was held, there was no public comment, yet we have board members who were reading public comments, but then tended to ignore any of the healthcare advice given by local medical professionals who treat COVID patients. I'm sure you all have been to a Novant facility or a Baptist facility. You go there for a heart attack, broken leg, psychiatric help maybe. Those are the ones that are treating you, but you're not going to listen to them when it comes to a public health crisis and a pandemic. It makes absolutely no sense when you're choosing to group, some of you choose to group yourself with those who want to pretend like none of this is going on, it's all fake news, 
what have you. But if we don't want to pay attention to math and science, let's talk sports, okay? I have a senior this year who has only had one year of school. So we were talking about how certain board members' kids were missing this and missing that. My senior has had one full year of school. He plays sports. Last year, he got to miss his entire swim season. Why? Because the swim coach decided COVID wasn't real, wasn't wearing a mask, went to swim practice, unmasked, having symptoms, exposed my child, and then he had to quarantine the rest of the swim season. So what are we going to do this year with a more contagious variant that is spreading rapidly? The day after your decision, Wake Forest, North Carolina, over 150 people are quarantined due to an outbreak at a school, a charter school smaller than Davie County. Several teachers, hundreds of students quarantined. How many days of school are they missing? 14. What is our plan? Do we have a plan? No, because we just wanted to prove we were so right. So, Union County, we were praising them. Yay, no masks in the schools. Hey, it hits the news. Union County Charter School, first week of school, massive outbreak, hundreds quarantined, no teachers. Teachers are, teachers are now exposed and they can't teach. Do we have a massive list of subs that are willing to come and teach or are we just gonna rely on parents to come and sit and then get exposed and take it home? You wanna complain about businesses not being able to operate? What about parents who have to go to work that are healthcare providers? What are they gonna do? Are they gonna to choose to stay home and take care of their kids? Or are they gonna to go to work and care for all the reckless people who are saying YOLO, this doesn't exist, go look it up on Google? Or are we just gonna to continue to shoot our healthcare workers in the foot? And then thank you, last of all, for making the decision or taking it away from me, knowing that now I have to go send my children knowing they're going to be exposed at Davie County Schools and there is no virtual option because you're only taking 20 kids because there's a wait list and all of the private schools are full now because guess what? Nobody wants to deal with this mess. I want my kids in school. They need to be in school. If they have to wear a paper mask, so be it. They will be able to play sports as long as they're not exposed and infected. There is, there is more psychological impact by not being able to be at school, sitting at home for two weeks with no virtual instruction because some idiot exposed you. It makes absolutely no sense and some of you should be very, very ashamed of yourself because you are reckless in spreading misinformation. Our next speaker is Thank Jennifer you. Harada, followed by Matt Johnson. Sorry, I was trying to put my timer on and it didn't agree. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Harada. Um, some of you know my husband, Todd Harada. He's a local physician here in Davie County. Um, some of you may not know, I'm also an RN. I worked in emergency medicine and outpatient surgery and stayed home with the kids for a while and since January have been doing vaccines for Novant for COVID-19. Although I did not agree with the decision of the board to make masks optional, it's where we are right now. And if Tak and I agree on anything, we do agree with supporting our public school system. We want this to work. We want our kids, our teachers, the staff to be safe. We do hope that you're sincere and that you are keeping a very close eye on the Delta variant. It's not a great variant. It's not, it is spreading quickly and we need to be conscious of that. Um, one thing before I get to my quarantine question, I just wanted to make note that with the Delta variant, it has been proven that the best way to protect ourselves is through vaccine and masking. At this point, our children, 11 and under, have not had the option to get vaccinated. And I understand that that's a choice, but my child cannot have that choice yet. So the safest would be, we believe, 
through what we've seen through studies and science, masking. So I'm going to move on from that. And my question is with quarantining. We are concerned. Um, there doesn't seem to be a plan in place for the quarantining. And I know that once an exposure happens, that will be a two-week period that it could be as many as one or two students up to a whole class could be out. And this could happen multiple times. So our question is, what is the plan, a solid plan for our students so they don't get behind academically? It's a huge concern in my house as my son has a lot of anxiety wrapped in his schoolwork. He likes everything by the book and he wants it, he wants to be able to get to his teachers and ask questions. And we don't really have that option as easily this year. And that's, I'm not saying that's anyone's fault, it's just the way it is. So what are our plans to make this as easy as it can be for our teachers, support staff, and our students so they don't fall behind academically and that we can keep them in school and keep them as safe as possible? So those were our thoughts and our questions. And we do appreciate you moving us forward even though it's a divisive issue. So that was our question. Thank you very much. It's <laughs> perfect. And our final speaker today is Mr. Matt Johnson. You <laughs> timed yourself. Hey. So thank you everybody for voting to make mass optional, but <clears throat> I do have a few caveats. I, I'd ask you guys to be bold, bold leadership, and, and I even pose this question to the first two speakers. I, I have a lot of questions about the whole quarantine process as well. Um, I've done a lot, you know, talking to other doctors, looking at, you know, trying to find the science and trying to find the preprints and the studies that show that masks work on kids, K through 12. I've come to many meetings over the past few months. I've sent many emails asking for someone, anyone, to send me the studies, the science that shows that masks work on kids. I'll get to that in a second. So <clears throat> I saw that in most of you being bold, I saw, I saw that boldness but it's obvious that we're still split and that, I don't know, half or whatever it is, we're split, but still support the idea of masking our kids. So for those that still are leaving that option on the table, where were you last week? You know, I agree. You know, we should have had public comment last week from both sides. And, and I hate to put it that way because, I mean, this there's not really one side or the other side. We just want answers. We just want to see and we just want some, some, you know, some leadership and some proof and some details from you guys. So, you know, last week, you know, for those that still have masks as an option, you had all the time in the world. I mean, everybody in this room would have sat here for an additional hour to listen to what you had to say or more. So if you wanted to spend a solid 15 minutes on selling us on the idea of masking our kids, but you didn't, then why? Why, why not go ahead and sell us? You got all the time in the world. Show us the data. Show us the facts. Show us the studies. Show us the almighty science. Show us where the emergency is in our state. You know, like 0.0002%, does that constitute an emergency? I mean, I understand that, you know, last year was bad. It was really bad. But we have to get back to normal at some point. We can't just keep masking our kids every couple of years or every, every time a variant comes up. I mean, there's like 200, there's probably 200 different Viruses, bacteria, everything else in this room at this very second. Pathogens, you name it. So, I mean, what are we going to do? Just for all of eternity, all for 
you know, the rest of our kids' life, just, you know, mask them. So there's now White House leaks from journalists that Biden and Cooper are going to put us through another lockdown in the next couple weeks. Could be another month or two. The mainstream media is hyping. If you haven't watched the mainstream media, they're hyping it up for us. So what are you guys going to do? A couple points. I may have missed it, but why are we not communicating to parents, teachers, and students the importance of, of a healthy weight, diet, and supplementing vitamin C, D, K, and zinc as much as everything else? And when we get phone calls, like it seems like every week, talking about this and that, camps and whatever, I mean, why can't we send out a phone call that says, hey, you know, most likely, you know, the vast majority of us are under constant vitamin deficiencies. And even a short, skinny guy like me is still 10 pounds over my ideal BMI. All these things, along with age, affect our reaction to COVID. Number two, bus drivers. Bus drivers should focus on driving our kids. I think everybody can agree on that, right? Not policing masks. If it's not enforceable, then it defaults to optional. Ha I mean, how are we going to enforce masks on buses? Number three, people are, ob people are obviously confused about the quarantine procedures. Why can't we do what we did last year regardless of masks or not? No one has proven to us that masks work on kids. Why would we be more restrictive now than we were before? If someone from, is someone from the state going to be in every classroom? No, of course not. If a positive test result is not symptomatic, then there's no need for quarantine. I believe even Dr. Man Mandy Cohen talked about this. M Mr. Uh, Johnson, if you could wrap up your comments. Please. Sure, absolutely. All right. So let me, let me finish up with a couple things here. So... The leadership in this room owes us at least that. If you're thinking about masking or complying with statewide mandates again a couple weeks from now, a couple months from now, on CNN yesterday, White House COVID advisor, Dr. Michael Osterholm. Okay, this guy is by far not a anti-science type. Mr. Johnson, I'm you not, could f finish, please. I'm not either. And he says, we know today that many of the face cloth coverings people wear are not very effective. So regardless of what happens, and I'll leave you with, with this. This is from the Iredale State School School District Superintendent's press release. If there is a new statewide mandate requiring students and teachers to wear a mask in schools for the 2021-22 school year, then the school district will grant in good faith religious exemptions provided they are documented by the parent, which essentially still sounds optional to me. Thank you. Board members, this concludes all the public address today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your comments uh, on a challenging situation. Um, I will now uh, entertain a motion to go into closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege pursuant to the North Carolina General Statutes listed on our agenda, and this is small type, uh, to discuss personnel matters per, uh, protected by state law and to protect student matters made confidential by general statutes and FERPA. And for clarification, I don't think we have any personnel. I believe we've already resolved the personnel. So no, we, yeah, there, we, I have some personnel. There's additional personnel? Yeah. Okay. I have a motion by Mr. Carroll. I have a second by Mr. Drexler. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 6-0. We are now in closed session. Thank you so much.